to you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, panelists, for joining us here. Uh, now, just a quick announcement. Towards the end of my discussion, I would open the floor for the audience. I would request you to kindly stand up and ask your questions so that our cameras could catch you. All right, so let me start by asking you, Gerard, you know, George Merck, the founder of the global pharma giant Merck said, and I quote, we try never to forget that medicine is for the people, not for profits. Profits will follow, and if we have remembered that they, that is profits, have never failed to appear. Do you think pharma companies today have this at the back of their mind when they price their products? <laughs> <laughs> That's a setup. Uh, uh, I, I think pharma and healthcare delivery have gone quite far from the original principles where it was founded. Uh, now it's driven more by different business models that do not necessarily accommodate uh, a social responsibility. It's, it's not loud? Yep, better? Yes. Uh, so I think our business models have changed quite a bit. Um, and let me sort of bring, bring it back. There is a contrast versus a Merck or, or a company like uh, as, as you had stated, or Roche or any of the large uh, farmers, versus companies that are here. So there is a pharma model which is different, uh, which is a blockbuster model, which allows you to do big drugs as long as you have a huge market, sure. and therefore you have to price for it. That's a different uh, market altogether. I think here our focus is a bit m more on healthcare services delivery, and how does that make it viable for uh, universal access, if it's possible at all. And this, uh, I'll tell you a bit about where I started from. Last year, I was on this panel doing a study for the Global Fund and UNAIDS, where I had to visit uh, for healthcare delivery services at the primary care level, so at the villages in West Bengal, Orissa, and Tamil Nadu, looking at HIV services delivery. Going to these villages, I actually sat through taking a coupon of when you come in and how long it takes for you to get seen. And once you go through this process, then you realize that we have grand visions in the center, but in terms of actual delivery of services, it's, uh, it's pathetic yeah. at the primary care. So for us to think about universal access, I'm going to take a very sort of, um, uh, uh, maybe a slightly provocative position that India may have the idealism for and the aspiration for universal health care, but it's not ready for actual delivery of such health care services. Would you, would you agree, Dr. C? Well, I, th I think at the outset, we must try and understand what we mean by quality health care. A universal health care is a different issue. Sure. But the context of the present understanding is quality health care. And quality health care does not require, uh, let's say it at the outset, that it has nothing to do with expertise. You don't like, require a superman type of expertise to deliver quality healthcare. You don't require the most high tech infrastructure to deliver quality healthcare because the word quality healthcare revolves around not the deliverer, it revolves around the receiver. If we put the patient at the center of healthcare delivery, we start understanding what quality healthcare is, and it has only a few components. If you understand the components, when we talk about quality, we say he should have an acceptable level of expertise given to him. It hasn't got to be Dr. Sait at every point in the whole country providing that. Sure. He has to have an acceptable level, which is of acceptable standards. That's the first aspect. He has to have an ethical practices forwarded to him. It has to be process oriented. I mean, where, and I'm talking about not just health, I'm talking about healthcare, not just medicine, not just clinical. Say, example, a patient comes for admission and there is a process to be followed to give him a timely access to admission or a discharge proceedings. And if a process is followed that's timely and anybody moves out of that cogwheel, the process will still be followed. It's independent of the individuals in it. So that's a process-oriented manner in which it's given. It has to be value. There has to be value medicine, a cost-effective care, which does, therefore means that if I was to do umpteen number of tests on an individual, I'm not necessarily providing good care. But if I delivered him cost-effective care, believing that the outcomes remain the same, then I'm okay. Yeah. So I don't really need to cut cost, but if I cut cost, keeping the outcomes good, then I'm delivering cost, 
After all, somebody's got to spend for it. Sure. And finally, I always believe, I always believe that it has to become outcome oriented. We are changing the world. It has to become outcome oriented. Look at the outcomes. Look at the touch points at every level, be it administrative, be it uh, 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 clinical. And if we, uh, we, if we are able to reproduce these, if we are able to audit them and have external audit, we deliver quality healthcare. Okay. Now, look at all these points, and I will ask any of you, look at all these points. It doesn't require any cost. It doesn't require infrastructure. All it requires introspection and creating those systems and processes and beliefs. So I don't believe, and I'm contrary to you, that it is not going to happen. I think that it's not a reality. It's reality in pockets. It's reality perhaps in some beliefs. The government spends okay, ah, got good. it. <laughs> so the government spends only 1.1% of the country's GDP, and an additional 3.7% is privately financed. So you know, almost 75% of the cost is being borne by the consumer. So this makes this makes our country one of the world's you know one of the world's most consumer-faced markets, health markets today. How do we make affordable healthcare a reality? expenditure on health is out of pocket expenditure sure. the the government system expenditure is only to the tune of 25% and if you look at the global statistics almost 50% 60% expenditure is government and out of pocket expenditures are less than 40% in most of the developed as well as the developing countries so in that sense i would say in this country the development of health has been more on the basis of individual areas of excellence individual places where the health sectors have picked up. And in that aspect, the private sector has, seems to have done extremely well because if you look at the total health scenario in the whole world, sure. the health scenario is in a mess. 
most countries are looking at better health, quality health care for their country. It's not just in India that we are debating this issue. If you look at US, they spend almost 18% of their GDP on health. And they still are not the best, the most healthy nation. Some of the Scandinavian nations, Japanese, the average longevity of life is much more in, in Japanese as compared to the uh, US. So if you really look at in terms of health delivery to an individual, possibly uh, we are sp the government of India spends one of the least amount of money on health, yes. which is 0.9 to 1 percent, whereas most other na nations spend 3 to 4 percent uh, on health. If you look at the South Asian, the Chinese, the other developing nations like Russia or Brazil also, and most European nations would spend 7 to 8 percent of their GDP on health. So there's clearly a need for an Indian way of handling this problem. We just can't pick up a ready-made model and apply it in India. Absolutely. So how do we create this sustainable healthcare infrastructure? Yeah. What, what are the ideas that we so, can... So, so that's what I was coming to actually, that the very fact that the health scenario is not too bad, although if you look at our infant mortality rates, they are certainly much higher than what is expected of a developing, so to say, nation. We've done very well in, in, on the economic front, but we haven't done as well on some of the health parameters, uh, if you look at the infant mortality rate or the maternal mortality rates, sure. or even longevity of life. The average Indian's longevity of life is 67 years. We've almost doubled it ever since our independence. It was about 44 years when we assumed independence. But if you look at the Japanese, it is 83 years. If you look, look at a UK, uh, average uh, length of life, it is about 80 years. So we still have a long way to go, but certainly there are pockets in India. If you look at the Kerala system, where people are more educated, if you look at the health parameters in Kerala and some of the other uh, states in India, the health parameters are almost matching some of the uh, developed country, uh, countries in the world. But there are a couple of areas like Uttar Pradesh, Odisha, Bihar, which bring down the national averages. So what has really happened, to answer your question over a period of time, is the Indian innovative system, the private health system has delivered, and that's the reason people have more faith and people go to these private uh, sector hospitals. Sure. If you look at my own hospital where I work, it's a no-profit organization. We don't like to call ourselves charitable. We like to call ourselves a service hospital. We are the largest hospital this side of Delhi with a 1,400-bedded hospital. And it's an institution which delivers, which is managed by the Munjal family, and it delivers health care to the people of Punjab, whole of the northern India. So such kind of examples, there are innumerable such examples of, uh, of institutions which have come up in various places on individual uh, systems. So we need to kind of expand these systems. Now, I am told the government want, wants to manage or organize these, these systems also. When the government has not been able to successful in its own model to deliver healthcare, huh. how can it manage a system which is doing fairly well, which is serving the people? So wherever the government has tried to manage, they have kind of messed up the thing. So I really don't think this new, new kind of a, um, thinking process which is going in the government's mind to manage the private sector is going to help. We might end up messing a system which is delivering to the individuals, which is based, as Dr. Seth just said, yeah. the Indian system of medicine is based on faith. Patients come to me on the faith that I am delivering the right quality, as he said, and it doesn't need any money. It just needs kind of good ethical practices on which the Indian system is based. Yeah. So quality comes, of course, with money, but also quality comes with faith, with uh, genuineness, with honesty, integrity, all these things. Sure. In fact, I just want to make a single statement. Quality actually saves money. I mean, that's the bottom line of all this. Sure. We talk about, unfortunately, we confuse our minds by talking about quality medicine as high-tech care, high-tech expertise, everything which comes at an extra cost. Let me just tell you, what it, I, I hate the word affordable medicine. I think it should not exist because it actually takes away from the patient. It's almost like Chinese stuff is affordable stuff. But that breaks in two days. I can make it affordable. I can make an angioplasty affordable to the patient. He can have some vague stent. He'll come back in three months with a blockage. Now, that's not affordable for him. That's not value medicine because look where we've learned from. We learn from what happens on that day, and we say this is affordable. If he has a readmission, he has to pay more. We, you know, one of our parameters of quality care is readmission. One of our parameters of quality care is how did he do well in the quality of life. He has to earn money if he's sitting in a bed after that. Yeah. So that is not affordable medicine. Value medicine is different. You actually say, you're going to make it, 
less expensive, but you're not going to compromise on the outcome. His outcomes are going to be, even in Trivandrum, as good as they were at the Scots Art Institute, even in, in, in a smaller tier two or tier three cities, as it happened here, provided we can get cost down. And yes, we can. We can actually have, have technology which is innovative. We can have practices which are innovative. We can actually do less investigation. We can be more conscious of what we offer them, but not compromise on the outcomes. Because that's where I differentiate from affordable medicine, which can shortchange people and actually make it more expensive. Why is government paying so much money and yet being ineffective in delivery? It, does, it is because it's not a cost-effective value medicine. Nobody is monitoring how many readmissions are happening from heart failure, how many deaths are going on. Everybody is only monitoring how much you spend on a patient for that particular admission. Sure. So one of the key areas that we need to focus on, and like Gerard said, is primary health care. How much of the health cost can the government actually bear? You know, and if, if majority of the patients are treated at the primary level, you know, it just stresses off uh, insurance schemes and, and make, make them more viable. Yeah. So uh, I, I can tell you that both Dr. Singh and Dr. Seth are heart surgeons, and therefore their heart is in the right place. So in terms of aspiration, clearly the, the, the idea of equal healthcare access as well as quality healthcare is an aspiration. Right? Now, if you look at the organizational problem of how you deliver healthcare services, that's very, very challenging in India. So uh, let's take a simple number, 1.5 million beds in India, of which 50% are defunct or not working or not accessible. And of these that are working, a third are in the top 10 cities where there are only 10% of the population. So if you look at the organizational problem of healthcare delivery, then it is a rich man's access. I know there is a differentiation between what is rich and what is poor, but the equal access means that if I'm in a village at the primary health care center, will I be able to have access to either uh, a nurse, uh, uh, somebody who can deliver the first responder services, or somebody who can deliver very primary services? And if you go at the ground level and then visit these different primary health care centers, what you will realize is that the doctor shows up, instead of coming five days a week, about two days a week at best. Right. You don't have access to very basic drugs that are available or very basic services in these primary health care centers. So for me, it is not an aspirational thing. I fully agree that India, on an aspirational basis, should certainly go for equal health care access. But for me, it is an organizational problem. How do you take the scale of this problem and solve it at, at least at the basic threshold where you can have some very basic services available for everybody free of charge. All right, you know, the healthcare insurance penetration in India is among the lowest in the world, comparable to underdeveloped countries like Nigeria and Bangladesh. And you know, the failure, the, the dismal condition of the public healthcare system, like Dr. Seth also pointed out, has given the rise to private healthcare system. And today, most of the India's population prefer private health facilities. So do you think that is it practical for the government to, uh, to, you know, to scale down its central role of providing health care? Actually, there is a, if you really look at the, the system that exists in a country, it, there is a dichotomy actually. There is a discord between the planning and its implementation. Uh, health as it is in this country is a state subject, but most of the funding lies with the, with the central government. So how does that fund trans, uh, kind of reach the state? They do not, till the National Rural Health Mission Program was uh, started in 2005, uh, there was not much laxity with the states as to how they spent this money which was being sent from the central government. So the funds were with the central government, but the state had to kind of deliver this healthcare delivery system, and they had to be, the, the system had to follow according to the rules and regulations set up by the center. So ever since this National Rural Health Mission, and now a couple of months back, the Prime Minister was speaking about the National Urban Health uh, Mission, and we are told there is going to be a national health mission. Uh, so we're re really looking at some very positive uh, thoughts in terms of health. Uh, at least the government is paying some attention, is paying some thoughts to this. And as you very rightly pointed out, the 0.9 or 1% expenditure of the GDP on yeah. health is dismally low. Unless you spend money on health, how can you expect the government to deliver? How, how, where will the resources come? 
Uh, so they, they are aspiring that by year 2020, almost 3% of the GDP will be spent on health. And I wish and hope that it happens earlier, because unless that happens, the government will not be able to aid some of these. Now, there have been some pockets, as I said. We had this Arogya scheme in Andhra Pradesh, and uh, we had a scheme in um, uh, Karnataka, uh, uh, which was successful. This, these were insurance schemes, as you said, in which the healthy pay for the sick people. And similar scheme is there in Punjab by the name of uh, Paikanaya scheme. So there are, and now the government wants to start this uh, national uh, uh, scheme for the, about, uh, wherein the poor will get a 30,000 coverage for the, um, uh, for almost every individual. And now with the identity cards coming for all the individuals in this nation. So we, are, we can really look at some of these things uh, coming up. Yes, and, have a, uh, just, can I just add on that, uh, Dr. Singh's point? Absolutely correct, in the sense that uh, the center state model and how it is organized is, is organized very dysfunctionally. That's the first one. So in other words, the funding is provided, but the accountability is held with the states, but with limited funding from the center. So the model itself is wrong. The second point that you've made is about the scale of the investment. Government investment at 1% has to be about tripled or quadrupled and matched with equal private increase to make this a uh, viable proposition, right? So I think both the issues, one is in terms of the governance as well as the, the model of investment, I think both have to be. I, I think that's rather simplicity, simplistic, I would say. And I, I just want to expand on this. Correct to start off, but it almost assumes the fact that the more we spend, the better healthcare we get. And unfortunately, even at the present spend, you yourself know very well because you did audits on this. Whatever there is is even not getting downwards. Correct. It's not going to what the purpose was for. And I think, personally, I believe that the government has to start understanding that the private health cares are not sitting on the other side of the table. We, at the end of the day, treating the same population of the country. The unafforders or the poor people are being taken care of the, by the government. And if they can't, that's their responsibility of the government at least to do that. And the ones who can afford and pay are being taken care of this vast private health care, which is doing exactly the same thing as the government is doing, but is making it more in a corporate, business-like, efficient model and delivering the same. It's actually taking the burden off the government yeah. so that the government could do its job for the unaffording in a better manner. I imagine if the government had to take care of everybody of the whole country. That was not going to happen. So therefore, there's a great health care which the government should thank for the job it does. And then let's not be suspicious of each other. Let more public-private partnership come in with confidence on each other. What's the, what's the biggest downfall at the moment? Suspicion. The private sector say, these guys are involved in red tapeism and corruption, and there's no way we can actually sit down with these guys because we can't deliver the way of cost-efficient medical care we want to do. And on the other hand, is this issue, the government say, that these guys are out here to make the money, and they're actually going to swindle all our accounts and actually make sure that their coffers were full and their shares rose so, in price. So is there if a If we can abolish that. And yeah. there, are, there are pockets of great public-private partnership which have been successful. That's what my question was. Is there a possibility of a public-private partnership in healthcare? It will have to come. The issue is no more. The issue is no more. With the awakening of the country, the issue is no more whether we can continue this log jam and sitting across the table and posturing for a greater period of time. People know, people want, people want effective healthcare. And if the government doesn't transition into better public private partnership, healthcare delivery would actually be so much back that the public is going to rise and say, this is our, our demands, this is our right to have healthcare in this country. Actually, if you look at it, look at the Rashtra Bhima Swasthi Yojana, yeah, which I was yeah. just mentioning, and also the, the, the Karnataka and the Andhra, the government now recognizes that the health care delivery infrastructure lies with the private sector. And it is for this reason that they want these insurance, these social insurance schemes to be delivered by the, by the private sector. Right. Because the government, I think I would like to add another thing is, the government has to now realize that it's the primary health care which the government needs to impart. We have a very big dichotomy. We have centers of excellence in this nation. We have two lakh people coming every year for medical tourism in our country. And on the other extreme, we have people who do not even get the basic 
kind of health delivery. So the government has to chip into areas which, are not, which the private sector does not get attracted to. The government has to kind of focus more on the private uh, healthcare system. If you look at most of these corporate groups that are there, they, they, they kind of uh, look at the tertiary care centers because that is where most of the corporates are attracted to. But the health delivery has to be primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. The tertiary care gets to an extent fulfilled by the private sector. The government needs to focus more of its attention on the primary care, and then, then we will be able to impart a, a kind of a more holistic uh, health de delivery in terms of quality. We will improve so, gradually. So which are the areas where you feel the private sector can maximize social impact? Uh, if you really look at it in terms of hospital-based admissions, hospital care, outpatient clinics, outpatient visits, almost 80% of the outpatient visits in India are to private sector. And almost 60 to 65% of the hospital admissions are in the private sector. Only 35 to 40% admissions are uh, in the government sector. So if you look at these areas, the private sector is kind of there and it is delivering. But the sad part of the whole, if you, if you go out of India and you go to any other country, what's the difference you find? You enter a hospital, it's as good as any other hospital, an Indian hospital. You go to a mall, it is as good as any other mall. Where are we different? It's in the social, social yeah. kind of public health areas, in the cleanliness. And I think it's sad that the, our government does not even, there's only one state, that is Tamil Nadu, which has a department or a ministry of public health. And we need to, the government needs to focus on these kind of preventive areas rather than pr focusing on therapeutic areas because therapeutic areas are either way being taken care of by the private sectors, the no-profit organizations like ours and also the corporate. Today almost 10% of the hospital kind of beds are with the corporate sector. So even this sector is contributing yeah. quite significantly. I'm just yeah. going to add on to that as a fact that uh, private healthcare, the corporatized healthcare. And I must differentiate this over the last 10 years to the private healthcare which existed before where nursing homes were the need of the, the patients and all that. It's now more, much more cost efficient care. Uh, it's looking at values, it's looking at quality, it's looking at end products, it's looking at parameters, it's looking at outcomes. Because that's, that's working out good for the hospitals, private hospitals, that's working out good for the patients. And corporate healthcare is realizing that the growth lies in tier two and tier three cities. So it's not as if th those days are gone where hospitals used to open up in the five metros. It's actually impregnating everywhere. If now the government partners, private healthcare, secondary models will become perfect. Primary models are for the government to take care of and that's where they should concentrate on. But now there's a widespread of good corporate efficient delivery of healthcare in quality based. And I'm always talking about quality because to me it's not the three Tesla CT scan, actually everything can be done at a much more cost efficient model, provided you actually know how to spend the money and the outcome should remain the same. Whatever happens in Delhi should be happening in Bareilly, should be happening in a sure. smaller city. You know, Jared, you've been uh, working uh, at the Rajiv Gandhi Center at Imperial College London. Tell us what are, the, what, are the, what are the things that the other countries need to learn from us and what we could learn from them? So, uh, uh, some of the points that are okay. made feed into that. Sure. So, I'll restrict my comments to one that I studied internationally comparing uh, HIV services here in India versus in other countries. And I can tell you the National AIDS Coordinating Agency, NACO, does, that does this, does a fantastic job. Uh, given the limited amount of resources, it really stretches and it tries to do this. And it does a fantastic job. Now, the way it is started making inroads is because of public-private partnerships. Sure. The, the difficult challenge in India is the ability to track a patient over time because of whether it's uh, migrant populations or whether they move from where the mother goes to the in-laws to have delivery of a baby, things like that, cultural practices. The ability to track information is the biggest challenge and therefore having a patient history becomes a challenge. Sure. Now some of these unique ID projects and things like that will change the landscape of that. But the public-private partnerships, the way they've structured it in uh, HIV services is that the NACO will provide the kit, the treatment and all those things, but the delivery is actually run through the private hospitals themselves. Okay. So I think that model of how the government can influence some element of it 
uh, but the delivery is done by somebody else. In return, the government gets the information about the patient. So it's really important, at least in HIV, to be able to track the success or, or treatment of a patient over time. And so when it gets that patient information, then it's able to share and deliver those services more effectively. So I think the PPP model is primary to how the future of healthcare is going to evolve. Uh, the second one is the business models of the uh, private providers will also change over time. So there was this model of uh, like a hub and spoke system or a feeder system uh, with a low cost uh, primary or a secondary care base and then a specialization base uh, in, in different regions. I think that model will have to be perfected over time. So the private sector model will also change. The government's role of public-private partnerships will also change. And both of these will give different effective governance mechanisms for the delivery of healthcare. So, so what are the things that they could learn from us? Um, I think the PPP models are one of the unique things that India is experimenting with. I think that is one where India is actually leading to sort of say, OK, how can we figure it out to provide public services through a private enterprise? Uh, that is one. The other element is on low cost innovation. So uh, NHS, for all its uh, capacities and its ability to provide effective services equally, uh, does have a problem with maintaining cost. So how can we learn in organ organizing and sort of the design of services that allow us to bring costs down is an important issue that the rest of the world looks to India to learn. All right. Can so I take you up this issue? Yeah, sure. What you said, what they can learn from us and what we can learn from yeah. them. Because this is, uh, I mean, a question very dear to uh, us uh, in all the things. I think what they can learn from us is uh, terms of what Dr. Seth also said, compassionate medicine and kind of uh, friendly medicine that we practice in this country. And they can also learn, I was in a hospital in US and we were taken, we were a group of about 10 doctors from various parts of the world and we were taken to the cath lab and all that and three days we had in the OPDs and at the end of that, uh, the doctor there was discussing with us what were your experiences and he just happened to ask us how many patients do you see. So he asked each the person and uh, I said, we see a lot, a lot of patients. And then he said, no, no, but how many? And I, I said, no, we see a lot more than what you said. They used to see about 10, 15 patients in an OPD which would span over four or five hours. So when he insisted, I told him, we almost see 50 to 60 patients in that much time. Because the numbers are so large, the volumes are so big, and we have to deliver kind of that kind of services to the patients. So in terms of expertise development, obviously an Indian physician who runs into so many larger numbers would obviously be more expert than a person who does much less procedures. What we can learn from them is, I think, areas of weakness that we have, what, uh, uh, what we just discussed, the external audit system which has to come to our system, and documentation. We somehow are pretty weak in this country in terms of health statistics, documentations. Sometimes when we discuss diseases and issues, we realize that we do not even have basic statistics. Although we treat patients every day and out, we have so much disease, but we do not even know the volume or the magnitude of the disease. Yes, so in yes, yes, one word on these issues is the very fact you'd be very surprised to learn that it's not just expertise which comes out in outcomes. Uh, we want to deliver quality medicine, and we say it's outcome-oriented. And if I was to remove the special expertise out there, but have a medical process which was guideline-based into place, I would have very similar outcomes at the end. It's very important to understand this, so that's not an individual that say that Ashok said did this procedure, and that's why that, that went well. If it was not process-oriented, if it was not check, a checklisted process, you could replace Ashok Seth with another guy and still have nearly the same outcomes coming and same successes. It has been proven time and again. It's like flying a plane where the doctor, where the pilot comes and there's a co-pilot. It goes through the checklist every time. He's done 800 flights. He goes through a checklist every time. That is why the process orientation comes in. Now, can you believe that guidelines which are created to actually make every doctor function in a uniform manner so that the outcomes could be similar are the doctors are the ones to blame for actually giving out quality-oriented outcomes. Actually, it's the doctors to blame at the end of the day. Because for every guideline which comes out, on an average, it takes doctors 15 years to comply to that uniformly, and therefore give a process-oriented outcome. 
So I think the biggest, another cog in the wheel of quality care, and if we are not trying to deliver it, the doctors do have to blame themselves because we are actually destined to get into habits which are very difficult to change over a period of time. And unless we change ourselves and start believing that we're going to be audited, that we're going to actually have look at what we did last year and see whether we can improve results through an external agency which tells us that from tomorrow you can't do this because this is not guideline based, this is not evidence based, this is your own personal ideas which don't result into good outcomes, which result into complications, otherwise you've got to stop functioning. We're not, we're not open to that. All right, you know, technology has played a huge role in today where, in taking healthcare industry where it is today. You know, we've got telemedicine centers which have given rural areas a jump, but still access and affordability, I know you don't like the word, but still access and affordability remain a distant dream. So how, what do you have to say about the rural healthcare sector? In terms of, uh, see, there have been significant changes in terms of rural healthcare if you look at. The dichotomy is, see, India produces about 36,000 doctors every year. Uh, in terms of number of doctors, we have about 7 lakh doctors in this nation. So we are not, uh, we are short of doctors. Uh, on an average, for every 1,000 individuals, we have 6 doctors, whereas the average in UK, in US is about 30. So we have one-fourth the number of doctors if you look at the population. Okay. And the second th issue is of kind of doctors moving to, uh, to the cities. So if this is, as I was saying earlier, this is the area where the government needs to chip in. Because someone was just discussing in the previous session, the market forces determine the system. So the market forces are kind of determining, people are moving to the cities. We have to create such market forces in the rural areas. We have to make jobs in rural areas lucrative for the doctor. Otherwise, whatever talk, whatever discussion we have, people will not move to the rural areas. So if we are genuinely, really concerned about rural, rural individuals, where 70% of India lives, we have to make, make things better in the rural health centers. We have to give better incentives to doctors to move into rural areas. We have to involve the private sector to kind of move into the rural areas, give some incentives, make things easier for them. Uh, only then will we be able to kind of translate our desire ever kind of uh, desire that we all have in our minds that we should deliver as good health care to rural individuals as we do to urban India. All right, you know, responding to the need of PR, the Planning Commission of India in early 2012 drafted a proposal on the lines of managed care system where the government's role gets diluted from a producer to just a manager. And, uh, you know, this is, this is said to help achieve the ultimate goal of universal health coverage. And this is supposed to revolutionize the Indian healthcare system. And, you know, the, it, it's on the best practices that have been followed in the US. So your views on that. Will this system help in universal health coverage? I'm sorry to say my views are very, uh, going to be very different from most of the people sitting in, hall, uh, in this hall. Because I personally feel wherever the government has tried to manage, they have made a mess of it. When it was the industry they were trying to manage, they made a mess of it and only when they opened up the industry the Indian economy really started kind of flourishing. What are they managing in healthcare? They are, ma they are managing the, uh, the pharmaceuticals and what are they doing to the pharmaceuticals? The health sector itself is flourishing. It is delivering to the individuals. People are having faith. So the market forces are determining where the people are, people are go going. You fail in something that you are doing yourself and then you try to manage a system which is, which is kind of delivering. So I really don't have much kind of uh, faith or respect for this change in the policy uh, that we are hearing about, that the government is going to manage. These managers, uh, I think, will be creating more obstacles in healthcare delivery system by the private sector, which, as you said, uh, kind of handles 75% of the health sure. delivery in this nation today. All right. Uh, you know, Gerard, uh, in can, India... Yeah. Can I give a couple of sort of perhaps radical suggestions? Uh, I was just thinking about it now as uh, Dr. Singh was speaking. Um, one of my relatives, uh, two years ago, wanted to do an uh, MD in radiology. So he had to pay one crore as a capitation fee to enter one of these universities. What if the radical solution is to say that all medical education will be free and paid for by the government, but you have to require those who take it free that they would spend five years in rural, delivering rural services? 
Sure. Right? You know, uh, in India, the estimated number of beds per person is 10,000 people is nine, and the av global average is 30. We've got only seven lakh doctors to cater to a population of 1.2 billion. So, you know, what are you, what are your views on capacity building? How do we do that? Uh, I, I think capacity building is probably the most significant issue in all of this, which is why one of the suggestions that I was saying is make medical education free. A lot of people who come into medic, medic, medicine or the practice of medicine now are those whose parents could actually afford it uh, to, to be able to pay that much to actually get people in. So if you remove that barrier, I think, and make actual supply equal access, I think the outcomes in, uh, in about five years, what you will see is a greater supply of people going into medicine and creating that. The second one is actually the provision of medical education. I think there is also a false monopoly being created in these, or oligopoly, whatever you'd call it. But there is a restriction of people entering medical education uh, in, the, in, in good guises, in the, in, to say maintaining quality, all these different words that you, they would use. But there is an artificial restriction of people who can actually provide medical education, whether individually or with foreign partners. Sure. So if you restrict medical education, you restrict the number of people going into medical education, it's no surprise then that you have fewer doctors, uh, even though you have more beds, and albeit that the beds are more in cities than in sure. rural areas. So, you know, before I let all of you go, uh, what would you, that is, what is that one thing that you would like to see happen to make quality health care uh, affordable for all a uh, reality? So we could start with you. Uh, the one thing that I would like to see is uh, uh, the government, and the private sector working hand in, hand in hand, and us as a nation finding solutions which are, which are relevant to our nation, because we cannot adopt sure. uh, solutions which other nations have adopted. We are a very pluralistic uh, uh, nation. We are very diverse. What is happening in UP is not happening in Kerala or in Punjab. So we really need to have our own uh, solutions to our Indian problems. Yeah, Dr. Shah. Yeah, I, I would say three things. Firstly, a belief in quality provision. You see, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was expertise related. It's no more expertise related. The need of the R is quality. The second issue relates to more micro insurance and public private partnerships, more micro insurance schemes and public private yeah. partnerships. And the third is innovations. Innovative models are here to be able to deliver quality healthcare downstream to secondary and tertiary care centers. And we are being developing them all the time, EICUs, electronic monitoring of patients placed distantly. All those are there. We just have to ap apply them. It's application of those. So I think that the dream is it's not a dream. There is a re realism to this dream. It's happening now. And we just have to see how we execute it. I think afford, it's not free health care for all. Believe you me, nobody survived on free health care for all. It's a disaster for even countries like United Kingdom. But it is affordable, quality health care for all. I think that's something which we can, we can strive for. All right, Jared. Uh, I think the aspiration of health care access is the right way to go. Uh, if you want to make it successful, you shouldn't draw things from the NHS as, as it is. There are things to learn from the NHS. There are things to learn from the US. But the success of India comes from experimenting with new business models new ways of thinking about it, new technologies, new, new mechanisms that you can implement. So I think the experimentation of new business models and new technologies is core to that. The second one is actually about creating institutional capacity. Expand the number of medical colleges, expand the number of doctors, make education free, but then re require people to actually have a service component which goes to Dr. Seth's sure. uh, thing about um, commitment to quality care. The third one is about information transparency. Or, uh, the, if we can figure out, if we have more information about what actually gets delivered, then we can have better governance. But if you don't have information, there is no governance. So the whole healthcare state issue, the whole model of how information gets shared, that needs a complete relook and reconsideration. All right, on that note, we'll open the floor for the audience. Kindly raise your hand. Yeah, if you could have a microphone there. Uh, sir, kindly, if you could just stand up and ask your question. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Bobby Mitra. 
Um, I had an observation and a question. <clears throat> so there's a, at MIT, they have a group called the Poverty Action Lab, headed by Abhijit Banerjee. And they did an interesting experiment in Rajasthan. Their premise was that people were not going to the public health care centers in Junjunu district and others because they were not as good as the private. So Abhijit and a team collected data for six months outside private and public health centers. The voice is, is, is yeah. blurred. Can you uh, hear me now? Because I think the speakers are that side. Sure. So yes, you'll have to speak louder. OK. Is that better? Yes, yeah. it's better. Great. I've often heard this feedback that your voice is too low. So uh, this group at MIT did a project in Rajasthan. Their premise was that people were not going to the public health care centers because they were not as good as the private. They captured data for six months and discovered that villagers were walking into the district headquarters during the lunch break when the public center was closed. And they switched that around and people started going to the public centers. So I just wanted to share this as an observation to question was that are there similar data-based models or projects going on to actually understand what the real reason might be? You've been uh, I, He's looking at me. I yeah. can tell you I've been involved in one of those things, but I'm sure there are plenty of different models that are in terms of studying uh, healthcare services, sort of the systems aspect of it, the delivery of it in India. And what you would find is that uh, this actual basic care or delivery would be equivalent wherever you go. It, it's the ability of accessing that that's the challenge. And I think all our discussion has centered around whether we can actually access that. Nobody would actually say that you get poorer healthcare service if you actually see the doctor. The problem is seeing the doctor. Sure. Another question, yeah. So please. Hi, uh, I'm Atul Raheja, and my question is actually to the panel. Uh, we are discussing quality health care to all, and I think, uh, I, I believe we've missed a very important point, and actually Dr. Said just touched upon it in the end, and uh, the whole use of technology to actually make this uh, accessible. You talked about sending doctors to the rural areas. I, I think it's a long shot. It's not going to happen very easily, but I think through technology, it's very much possible to actually get this delivery down to uh, actually virtually anywhere. And, and I don't even know, and as he talked about, if it's more process-oriented and process-driven, you may not even need a very highly qualified doctor sitting in some rural center. It could well be maybe just a nurse who's actually communicating with a doctor live somewhere sure, even 10,000 sure. miles so what's away. The, what's the so question? Yeah. Why, why are we missing out the whole technology piece in the delivery of quality health care to I all? I think what he's discussing is the telemedicine. Yeah. And it's an, partly. am I right? We did touch partly. that, yeah. Uh, partly, yeah. And this is an issue which uh, is kind of dear and close to most medical institutions in the country which reach certain level. Uh, Mr. Sudeep Banjal wanted us in our hospital to start telemedicine. We have started telemedicine and so have others all over the country. And a group from Bangalore is very active in telemedicine. So telemedicine is something, a reality. It's not something which has not kind of crossed the minds of healthcare delivery individuals. There is a little bit of a catch in this because in our country, the patient goes to a doctor for a faith. The patient does not like to be treated by a television or by a remote control. So the, the kind of takers for this telemedicine are not that many. Although it is a model which is working in various places, for doctor to doctor advice, it is successful. But for a patient to doctor advice, it does not translate into much, many numbers kind of being satisfied with this. So but in this respect, we do have an issue. But if you, if you look at telemedicine in terms of doctors to doctors advice, certainly it, uh, technology plays a huge role I, in this. I just want to just, just put that on a m larger level rather than just focus on telemedicine. You're absolutely right that tele IT has to be used with intelligence and a lot more can be done. Uh, it will never be for all because that's impregnable. There are certain pockets and certain rural areas where it will not be impregnable, where there may not be even a doctor to actually help those people. We have discussed that. But certainly it can go downwards, definitely, to provide those outcomes which I'm talking about. For example, the EICU setting, which we created along with G, which is so innovative that Jeff Melfant and R discussing it with me, how to actually transfer it back to the United States, was an example where actually you can monitor patients in smaller and smaller towns, 
with a model which is in critically ill patient and change their outcomes. We can actually do that across the country through innovative models. And there are more and more such models in place by healthcare. So we've got to use technology very soundly. Sure. We'll just take one last question. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on the difficulty of finding doctors in the rural areas. But there's also another big problem where there are no clinics, there are no labs, there are no physiotherapy centers. How do we encourage the small entrepreneur to take up these kinds of uh, support uh, so that the ecosystem is there, not just a question of lack of doctors? I think healthcare has to be considered an infrastructure. I think the long-standing issue will always be that. If it's not considered as an infrastructure, then we will never have solutions in place. We will actually be still discussing and arguing these. And this nation has to believe that healthcare is a shared responsibility of all individuals who can put their efforts into keeping a person of this country in good health. If that is believed, then you will actually start seeing little labs springing up. You will see innovative models of low cost, efficient services coming in and it will go downstream to the very villages at some stage we're talking about. Maybe it may not be now, but at least 25 years from now. So we're not looking at solutions in the next five years saying our smallest guy in a, in a little village of a billion population will get that health care. But we're not even, what we want to make is a step towards that. All right, you know, due to time constraint, we'll have to wrap up this discussion. Thank you, audience. Thank you, panelists, once again, for joining Thank us you. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shruti, for taking that. That was our session on quality health care. May I request Mr. Sumat Munjal, please? Or the group chairman would like to come and give away the mementos as a mark of thanks to each panelist, starting with Dr. Gurpreet Singh Ji, Dr. Shok Seth, Ms. Shruti Mishra from CNBC TV 18. And Professor George. Can we put our hands together for this wonderful panel? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Friends, we now break for lunch. May I request everyone to be back at 2.55 sharp so that we have five minutes settling time. Three o'clock we start with the Mind Mine Exchange.